grew up in Richmond. Um, one grandfather was a cattle farmer, the other was a tobacco farmer, so there's always plenty of farm to play on. Um, brother and I basically ran around getting dirty, <laughs> tearing up her shoes and making her mom mad. As early as I can remember, I was always, we called it playing guns. So we'd be, you know, we hide in the woods with those plastic guns that you pull the trigger and they go rah, 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 rah. We're in the woods playing with those all the time. You know, it's something that was always of interest to me that I always thought, man, I should do that. I should join the army, I should join the army. Um, it was sort of more of a uh, passing interest than an active one. Um, until, you know, I got older, I came to, you know, I graduated high school, I came to school for a while, um, was more interested in what was downtown than what was at the library. Um, so I left school for a bit, and then um, I decided I was gonna enlist after 9-11. I was getting dressed, um, getting ready to go to work. I was in the shower, my roommate, like, burst in the shower, and. You know, your first instinct when you're in the shower and your roommate busts in is, what the hell do you want? And he says, we're under attack, we're under attack. I'm like, what the hell? I'm thinking the depot's blowed up or something. Blowed up, that's proper English, right? That the depot's been blown up. And uh, <clears throat> so I go outside and at this point, um, one plane had flown into the tower and we just sat there watching it, man. And I thought, man, this is bullshit. I'm about to go on this. Because, I mean, you know, after we attack, somebody attacks us, we're attacking somebody, so. The next day I went to see my recruiter, uh, talked about, you know, your typical options, what, what job you're gonna do, you're gonna be, I, it, I went to the National Guard recruiter because I knew in the Guard that I would be able to enlist and go fight and also be able to be here for other things on, on the state level and be able to help at home, like um, Katrina, I went down to help with Katrina, stuff like that that I'd be able to do. So I go to the recruiter and uh, talk to him and basically the recruiter tells me, hey man, you gotta lose 30 pounds. I'm like, man, really? <laughs> so, after I'm, you know, I'm all excited, I'm there, I'm ready to go, and he says, man, come back when you lose 30 pounds. So, I had to go lose 30 pounds. How'd you do that? Believe it or not, it was Rocky Balboa style, man. I would, like, go running with a backpack on, because I thought it was cool. And, um, you know, I changed my diet drastically, and eventually I got there. My family was fairly supportive. Um, my dad was in the military, um, so my mom was familiar. My grandfather was in the military. Both grandfathers were in the military. So it wasn't um, a huge shock to my family. Maybe my timing was a little off for them, but um, you know, they, were, they were really supportive of it. I left for basic training uh, April 8th. And I remember that because my birthday is on the 7th. And I was actually supposed to go that day and forgot. And then they called me and said, hey, where are you at? So, so I went you got to, off to a bad start. <laughs> I got off to a horrible start. <laughs> when I was at MEPS, there was this kid that was in my room and this guy was nuttier than a squirrel turd. And he, he spent all night like rolling around and shooting fake people in his bed. Really? Yes, all night. MEPS was a horrible experience. MEPS was a worse experience than the first day of basic training. I went to Fort Bliss, Texas, which may be the crappiest place in the entire world. I think the rest of the world puts what they don't like in Fort Bliss, Texas. Hot, there's no grass, there's no trees. You are a nine iron from Mexico. But the food was really good. The food in this place is second to none. Um, had a drill instructor there that was, he was the drill instructor from Full Metal Jacket, except he was Latino. So he had a, a funny accent, which would make you giggle on occasion, which is not something you should do when you're just looking. The first couple of weeks, we were sort of meshed in with everybody else. 
and then there were so many more transportation people coming in that they branched us off to where we were all transportation in the same day. They made a, trans a company strictly for transportation instead of having a platoon inside of a company that was for transportation. But being with the rest of <coughs> the uh, air defense guys and the Bradley guys, we were like the, the runts of the litter. You know, they, they emphasize the fact, hey, you know, the, it, there's a war going on, pay attention. You know, it wasn't, not that AIT or basic training was ever lighthearted, but I think they uh, emphasize the fact, hey, look, so you're, you're going to go fight a war, pay attention. That's the, you know, that's sort of the military culture. You run your mouth and talk shit to people and, you know, I'm tougher than you. I mean, it's just how it is. Whether you're talking about um, uh, air defense guys talking to transportation guys or, you know, one infantry guy talking to the other or, you know, whatever. I mean, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I did, you know, I don't, I never felt like I was less than a soldier because I was going to be a truck driver. AIT, not a lot of learning. <clears throat> not a lot of learning going on there, for me anyway. I mean, because they were teaching me how to drive. I mean, granted, there are procedures that you need to learn the way the Army drives versus, you know, how you drive at home. But it was, I started, I started to say pointless, but it wasn't as informational as one would hope. Because really all you're learning is how to drive in a line behind somebody. My first drill was as nerve-wracking as my first day at basic training. Because you come from the environment where, you know, you always run from place to place. You're always either at tension or parade rest. And that's what you expect when you show up at drill. Drill not like that. Drill is far from that. So um, my first drill, I was nervous, man. I, I didn't sleep the night before. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anybody there. So, you know, I showed up and didn't know where to go, didn't know where to stand, didn't know what squad platoon I was in. That first drill was a nightmare. Sometimes we would, you know, spend the entire drill um, doing maintenance on our vehicles. Some drills we would drive to nowhere and back. Um, you know, some drills we'd work on um, firing from our vehicle. You know, a, a typical drill was, you know, go to the motor pool and work on vehicles. That's typical, or most common. From my first drill until my last drill, all that anybody talked about up or down the chain of command was we're getting deployed, or we're getting deployed again, or you know, whatever. So it was a constant, you know, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. So we always, you know, we were always checking our equipment or packing this bag for that thing or, you know, have this ready, fill this paperwork out. It was always, it was constantly getting ready. Uh, on a personal level, I, I felt like that um, we, somebody pulled a switcheroo on us and said, hey, they did it, but we're going over here. Um, but, you know, soldiering on, you know, pack your stuff and go. I felt like that there was, a, that it may not be the place that we needed to be. Um, but I felt like that there was good to be done for whatever reason. Um, you know, a lot of people say that we were there for oil or whatever, you know. Um, I think the fact of the matter is that however you justify it, we were there and there were people that needed our help one way or the other. We knew it was coming. You know, it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. So uh, my take on the situation was, you know, it's going to happen. There's no sense in me sitting here worrying about when. So I just sort of went about, went about daily life. You know, go to drill on drill days, and um, I got a call while I was at work. 
picked up my stuff and left. You know, you know when you're watching a movie and they put the camera on the guy and like he's still but everything around him is spinning. It was a lot like that, man. It was the most surreal thing that's ever happened. Because just in that moment, you realize my life just changed irrevocably forever. There is no starting back from here. That's it. Whether whether you deploy and come back, whether you deploy and don't come back. From this point forward, it's going to be different whether you like it or not, and there's not a thing you can do about it. So I had to go home to a, you know, a woman that I've been married to for three months and say, hey, uh, got to go. How did she take that? About as well as you would expect her to. Yeah. It was not a good day. You know, something that I never really felt like that we were taught well enough was how to call a medevac. How does that work? Do you remember? No. <laughs> I remember the basic. I don't remember. I mean, there was, what, nine lines to a medevac? I don't remember all nine lines. I didn't remember them then. I had a damn card in my helmet. Right. You know? We operated out of Camp F. John Quick. That's where your your company would stay. Is on right. Point. That's where that's where our motor pool was. That's where my tent was. That's where my foot locker was. That's generally where I was not. Her company was a head company, which heavy equipment transporter, basically um, uh, Abrams tanks, Bradleys, whatever. Our commander gave us a motivational speech, which really wasn't very motivational because he's a dumbass. Any memorable lines or? I, you know what? I remember this guy saying, what did he say? He said, now mind you at this point, he's been down the road like, you know, one time. I don't even know if he went into Iraq. He's been driving around in Kuwait. He says, if you want to know what being on a mission is like, get your buddy to get a hair dryer, point it in your face, and get somebody else to throw sand at you. That was his motivational speech. Not very motivational, is it? We were tasked with taking incoming units to wherever it may be and the outgoing unit back. We would load up the incoming units equipment in Kuwait at the port, wherever, um, load up their stuff, take it to wherever they were going, and Hopefully, the unit that was coming home was in the same base, usually not. So after we unloaded their stuff, we would go find somebody who was coming home, load up their stuff, and bring them back. I'd say an average mission was nine days long. So pack up your stuff, make sure you got everything, don't forget your weapon, you know. What kind uh, of stuff would you pack? I packed. Um, clothes, obviously, uniform. Um, other than standard issue stuff, usually, um, usually had some sort of trail mix, um, tobacco, uh, beef jerky was huge, man. You could trade beef jerky for somebody's wife, depending on the wife and the beef jerky. Um, but, you know, food, because, I mean, who wants to eat MREs all the time? So, you know, pack your snack bag, and everybody had a cooler that, you know, obviously didn't have beer in it, but um, Gatorade, soda, because water all the time sucks, too. But um, that's basically what I carried with me. If you remember when the uh, war first started, um, what's that? The, then uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld was criticized for us not having proper equipment. The first mission I ever ran into Iraq, my Humvee didn't have doors. Right. No doors. The first Humvee I was in, um, you know, the hatch is just 
flip a thing back and stand up. You know, there's a strap to sit in, which is more uncomfortable than standing the whole time. Um, you know, it was just me, my gun in front of me, an ammo box, and that was it. No shield on the gun, no, you know, now you see Humvees, they got 360 degree protection. Nope. I don't put the blame on my unit. I put the, you know, it just wasn't available. There wasn't the resources for them or us or anybody else to have everything we needed. It just wasn't available. So you didn't see other units? Uh, no. Um, when we started our trucks, I mean, it was the same, the, our trucks had the same doors on them there that they had on, had on them here. And you could shoot a pistol through them. Um, somehow, I, we got a, like old like flak vests. I don't know where they came from, but guys were hanging them on their doors, you know, which may or may not help, but if it worked, it worked. So you improvised sometime. <laughs> we improvised all the time. I ended up, and I told you the first Humvee I was in didn't have any doors. There was, the guy that was my driver was a gifted mechanic. And he was, you know, he was the kind of guy that could, he was MacGyver. It was what this guy was. So he and I go searching through a junkyard of old blown up, torn up vehicles. We find a gunner's hatch from a Bradley, take that off. And then he finds all this sheet metal from something. I don't know where he got this thing stuff from. Next thing I know, our Humvee has a hard top on it. One of the big, the tall one has that on it. He's put the hatch from the Bradley in the top of the Humvee and lined the inside with sheet metal, which made the Humvee sort of like a rolling kettle because it was really freaking hot in there. I don't know whether that metal would have stopped anything or not, but I felt better about it. And having that hatch was fantastic. The first few months it was you know you try to interact interact with them and you know you try to create good feelings toward you and towards the united states and you try to um, show them that you know you're not a bad guy you know you got all this stuff on you got guns and you know you got big trucks and weapons but that you know you're not there to hurt them and then when you do that man it's like eventually these they come from they're like cockroaches coming out they come from everywhere wanting to sell you everything from bootleg porn to cigarettes whatever they happen to have they want to sell it to you they will not leave you alone they will not go away so you go from you go from a place where you're trying to be friendly and say hey you know i'm not here to hurt you i'm uh i'm, I'm headed for them to a place where it's like, man, if you don't get off my truck, I'm gonna shoot you. Which, I mean, I, I realize that sounds cold and uncaring, but when you got, you know, 30 kids climbing on your truck, one of them could have a bomb. I don't want them on my truck. Depending on which base you want. Some bases weren't, some bases you show them the moving order and ID and obviously there's a gigantic line of green trucks behind you, you know, some of them are just, okay, go on. Some of them want to search everybody. Some of them want under the trucks, in the trucks. Take you three hours to get through the daggone gate. Sometimes, you know, we would drive at night, which never made sense to me because we didn't drive with our lights off. So we looked like a gigantic row of Christmas trees driving through the desert. <laughs> yeah, we got lost. We got lost because we were following um, people from another company. They were taking, they were uh, escorts. They were escorting us. They escorted us the wrong daggone way into the middle of this little bitty like back alley in Baghdad. And you, we got these gigantic trucks. You just can't turn around anywhere. I mean, even here when we're driving, we have to go to, I mean, if we stop, all, we have to go to a big truck stop. We couldn't just pull off anywhere. We're in this alley 
thing that I couldn't drive my car down now. I'm trying to drive these trucks and we just wouldn't fit. So now we've got a hundred trucks down this alley that now we have to back up out of. This process takes about five hours while the the population is coming out to see what we're doing, which made for a very hairy situation. It's a tense situation to be standing in the top of a Humvee and people Iraqis are literally surrounding me. You know, I can't pull out my gun and start shooting. You know, you can yell at them and tell them to go away, but they know I'm not going to shoot them. So they don't care what I say. How'd you keep them away? Didn't. I mean, nobody got close enough to the vehicle to touch it. But they were close enough, and there were enough of them. Had they had ill intentions, I was screwed. My first memory of combat is hearing the whistle of an incoming mortar. That is the most terrifying noise I can imagine. Because you can hear it, you can't see it. You don't know where it's going to land. It might land on your head. It might land way over there. You don't know where it's going to land. Most, that's, I mean, to me, that's scarier than hearing bullets go by your head. Why? Because it's, it's present, but you don't know where. You can't hide from it. You can't get behind something and block yourself from a mortar. There's no control of the situation. No, I mean, you can, like I said, you, I mean, you hear that whistle and you hear it on the movie, it's like, man, I bet that sucks. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. You can't take cover behind a pile of sandbags from a mortar because it might land right there. It was the same day um, I heard that mortar coming in. It was Easter Sunday, 2004, maybe, something like that. I don't know, man. Yeah, Easter Sunday in 04. We were staged at Baghdad International Airport, and we had been there for a day or so, waiting to move. We had some maintenance issues, best I remember. And um, just suddenly, all hell breaks loose. They start, and I can't understand why, they were shooting at the wall. Instead of shooting over the wall, shooting at the wall, and just suddenly all hell breaks loose. I was in the middle of a game of spades. I didn't have my uniform on, I had my shirt on. Well, I had my pants on, but I wasn't dressed for, for action. Um, there was a, a canopy tied to my gunner's hatch so for shade. It was like, holy shit, and there's a berm behind us. And I looked up and there was a Humvee parked on the berm and a guy with an M16, and then there was a guard tower. An RPG goes by the guard tower, the guard jumps out of the tower, from the top of the tower, jumps out of the tower. Never mind you're on freaking guard duty, just jump out, you know what I'm saying? And then the guy on the berm with it in the Humvee is, he's, he's kind of ducking and doing this number, hiding. I'm thinking, shit, man, we're about to get, they're about to break through this wall and overrun us, and we're standing here playing daggone cards. So I put my flak vest on. I don't remember how I got the canopy off the Humvee. I think I cut it off. I don't remember. But I get my stuff, get in the Humvee. Um, somebody, I don't remember who, got in the Humvee and drove me up onto that hill. And the guy that was up there, I had backed his Humvee off and come, walked back up there. And I, I remember saying, what are we shooting at? He said, they're over there. So cocked and locked and went through about 900 rounds. You know, like I said, when you get when you got farther north in Iraq, it got a little sketchier because they would lob mortars into bases on a regular base. Base, bases, bases. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't feel less safe on a base because of that. I was just more aware. Did you feel like you were adequately prepared for that situation? You know what, I st I'm still not sure about that. I remember 
that I was thinking, you know, I'm standing, you know, behind my 50 cal, firing my weapon, and I remember hearing bullets, and I remember having the thought that if I could, if I could hear them, because initially I hear it and I'm like, you know, I'm ducking, but I remember thinking to myself, if I can hear it, I'm still alive. And you can't dodge a bullet, literally. So I figured I'm just going to stand here and I'm going to fire this weapon until they stop or I stop. Right. Was, you know, and that was really the only way I thought that you could deal with it. Because, I mean, I can't stand here behind my weapon and not fire it. I can't stand here and dodge the bullets that are here because obviously if I hear them, they're gone. So it was either, you know, duck and hide or you know, fire my weapon until I stop or they stop. During your deployment, did you have a chance to call home and talk to your wife at all? <laughs> yes, and that makes another interesting story. <laughs> the, f the first time I called my wife, I'd been there for six or eight hours, long enough to process and get where I was supposed to be. And, uh, would go and find a phone and wait in freaking line and all this crap. And I call her up and we talk for about 10 or 15 seconds. And she says, guess what? I thought, you know, hell, I don't know. I said, what? She says, I'm pregnant. And I thought, son of a bitch. <laughs> and my first thought, and I should not have said this, my first, the first thing out of my mouth was, is it mine? Like a jackass. And, uh, which didn't go over well. Did you have any reason to believe it was? No, other than I was in another country, but I had just seen her like two weeks before that. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, that was my first conversation on the phone with my wife, oh. was I'm pregnant. It was nerve wracking, man. I mean, trying to figure out how to be a soldier and survive a war at the same time worried about how to be a father when I get home because this is I mean remember this is January a deployment is longer than nine months so I set up my R&R &R time so it would coincide with when my son was supposed to be born and uh, you know thankfully I got I got to be able to come back here and see that happen I landed in Atlanta I got off the plane and I'm walking to my connecting flight. And for some reason, I was the only person around. I don't know where everybody else went. But I start going up this escalator, and I hear people clapping. In my head, I'm thinking, what in the hell's going on up here? So there's nobody around me, which makes no sense in an airport like Atlanta, that there's nobody around me, but there wasn't. I get up to the top of the escalator, and there are people standing like all the way around these steps clapping and they're looking at me and I'm thinking there's somebody behind me I'm like what the hell are these people clapping for and this lady comes out of the crowd she's wearing like a, a USO button on her shirt and this lady walks up and shakes my hand and says thank you and I, and I said I was still confused and I said what are what? she said well, we knew you were coming so we decided we'd sign in and clap for you Man, that was that was one of the more amazing feelings that you know you've you've been fighting this war for so long and you don't know if you know you're gonna live the next day or you know I'm trying to go home and see my son be born and then you know all these people that I don't know from anybody else in the world are standing. I mean, there weren't ten people; there were seventy-five people standing there clapping because I'm on my way home and I'm wearing my uniform. It, it was a pretty amazing feeling. My son had a hard time uh, he had a hard time coming into this world uh, but, <laughs> but he made it and uh, six years later he's still kicking. What's your name? Cade. Mm -hmm. So you got to spend a little bit of time with him yeah. before you left. Yeah, he was actually, like I said, he had a hard time coming. He was actually pretty sick when he came. 
and he was in the uh, neonatal ICU for a week. My commander let me stay until he got to come home. So Somehow I got put on uh, a lovely job of scouring the country of Kuwait for containers, connexes. So, there, I mean, it wasn't just me, there was a group of people. But our job was to more or less go from base to base in Kuwait and find these containers that are missing. Um, apparently, the government didn't own these containers. They were leased to the government at an extraordinarily high amount of money. So the job was to go around and find those, which we did, and we found a lot of them. And um, that, that, I mean, it was cool to do something different and be able to drive around Kuwait in a real car. But man, that, we did. I did that for two months. So you drove around Kuwait and just with cities and stuff, or? I, I mean, drive from base to base. I mean, but it, I mean, it was cool for like a week. But after a week, it started to suck. Okay. So getting ready to leave your deployment. No one's been seriously injured? Uh, one KIA in the company. Some of my buddies from my squad were um, gone on that mission in that convoy. And the platoon sergeant came around to all the tents. You know, everybody come up here, we got to, I mean, instantly, you know, if they're getting everybody together, something bad happened. They don't get you together to say, you know, we're going to have a company volleyball tournament. So my only thought was, man, it's, you know, I'm worried about my buddies. But um, yeah, man, I remember everybody was standing around a circle and commander told us that uh, Lieutenant Henderson had been killed. You know, you come, when you get back right after you stop and uh, debrief and they say, you know, you can go get checked if you go get checked, you're going to be here another two weeks. Who in the hell is going to go do that? I mean, if your arm was cut off, you wouldn't go. So you had to stay two more weeks. So, you know, sort of a catch-22. You can go get checked out or you can go home. Which one do you want to do? I've been gone for a year. I'm going home. It seems like it was a couple of weeks after that there was a welcome home ceremony at the uh, Alumni Coliseum. What was that like? Uh, nobody wanted to be there. You know, they were, it was to honor us and say, you know, thank you. But on the whole, we didn't care. We didn't, it was some, another thing we had to do that we didn't want to do. You know, you could have just given me my crap and said thank you instead of making me stand there for two hours and listen to people tell me, you know, good job. Before I left, I was working as an insurance agent. And I, you know, I was new to the business, so I wasn't working purely on commission. My boss was paying me um, some money above the table and some more money under the table, which is fine, you know. Um, I get back, call him. Excuse me. I get back and I call him, and he says, "I can't afford to pay you." Thank you. Man, that's some, really? And he says that he can pay me what he was paying me above the table, but not the rest, which what I was getting paid above the table wouldn't buy gas. So the short answer is no, I didn't have my job. Uh, coming back, I came home, I had a four month old son, uh, didn't have a job. You know, it's still edgy from fighting a war. It was, it, you know, and sometimes still is a difficult transition to go from, you know, combat to being normal or normal. Um, you know, the, it created problems with you know, me and my wife, um, which you know had been had been created and started while I was deployed, and it just compounded it. Um, we ended up getting divorced. And, um, you know, life goes on, I guess. Helping out with Katrina 
was one of the more frustrating things I've ever done because, you know, and, and now all you ever hear now is, you know, FEMA took a week to get water to New Orleans, which, which is partially true. Um, it took me and my unit, it took us, I want to say four days to drive down there. Mind you, we're driving military vehicles that go 45 miles an hour, 50 downhill if you give it to Fred Flintstone out the door. You know, it just took a while to get down there and it was frustrating to not be able to get there and help. But once we got there, we were actually at, at a, a training camp in Mississippi is where we staged from. Once we got there, it took another, man, almost almost another week for us to even get supplies to give out, to know where to go. I mean, which may or may not be the military's fault, but what you have to remember is that the infrastructure in New Orleans and Mississippi was basically destroyed. And it was frustrating to be there and want to help and try to help and have all the wind in the sails you can imagine, but nowhere to take it. And, and I mean, besides that, the place was destroyed. I mean, there was, uh, it was destroyed completely. Did you feel like you was able to help out at least some? Man, you know, I would like to say that I helped out some. I, but in reality, I probably didn't. Being able to lead soldiers is, you know, probably one of the best uh, learning environments because, you know, it's, it's not something you can do wrong and get away with it. You can do it wrong, but you're not going to get away with it. So, you know, it's a good experience. Um, can be a bad experience. It's just one of those things where, you know, there's a way to do it and you can do it that way and do a good job, or you can not do it that way and not have that job anymore. You know, maybe, hopefully, uh, there, you know, there's some good to be done, and you know, maybe I can do some. You know, I don't, I don't have any aspirations of being the savior of all veterans, but um, you know, hopefully, I can, I can help out somebody that needs it. You know, it's it's not an easy thing to do. It's not something that you can sign up, walk through the door, and walk out the back door and be fulfilled. It's something that, you know, it, there's gonna be pain, physical and mental and emotional, and you're gonna suffer. Um, you know, you're gonna go through some, uh, you know, maybe mild, maybe severe personal tragedy. Um, it's not going to be an easy thing to do. It's not going to be an easy thing to accomplish, especially, you know, we don't, where's the next war going to be? Is there going to be, or when is it going to be? You know, it's not, uh, not something you can just sign up and breeze through. But the backside of it is, you know, it, it, it will make you a different person. Whether it's better or not is up to you. It, it, that's all in your attitude towards it. And there are lots of opportunities available on the other end of it. You know, I sort of feel the same way now that I did the day I enlisted. You know, I want to do something to help out, which is, you know, why I go with the Legion or why I do Patriot Guard or, you know, why, I do, why I'm doing this, you know. Homeland Security. Homeland Security. The biggest lesson that I've learned that I think maybe people could benefit from, and it's something that I think of, think about every single day, is that it's not as bad as you think it is. And you should focus on the things and the people that are actually important instead of 
everything else around you that really at the end of the day is inconsequential. You know, making sure you have the nicest car, making sure your yard is perfect, all those things. At the end of the day, when you are laying in your deathbed, they do not matter. Nobody cares. Take your time, spend it with your family, spend it with your friends, and live your life in a manner in which you're not constantly stressed out and worried about material things and what job you have and all that stuff. It doesn't matter. What does matter is the people you're spending with.